Okay, for, for today, we'll be talking about models and standards. It's a pretty long presentation, but only because throughout the presentation, there will be examples. Uh, as we go through the examples, I won't really dwell on them too much. Um, there will be an opportunity for you to go over the examples at your own pace. Um, but for those slides that would require a little bit of explanation or commentary, I will dwell on those instead. Okay, so in a way, uh, we'll try to balance out the, the need to, to clarify things to the best that we can. And for the examples wherein they're really meant to clarify certain things, we'll, we'll, we'll leave them to do their jobs. Now, we're going to talk about models and standards. Now, if you recall the six architectural elements, you have drivers, you have goals, you have metrics. And normally, this would be at the business view or the business level. And then the other three architectural elements would be principles, models, and standards. So we're now talking with the last, talking about the last two elements. They're not really that complicated. Uh, however, the understanding is that you need to be uh, aware or a little bit abreast of, of what models and standards would be applicable to certain situations. So the the, the whole goal right now is that okay, we'll tell you why models and standards are important and we'll show some, some examples on what they would be, but it's really up to you to be updated with, with the relevant models and standards uh, 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 given a certain problem or certain objective or certain architecture. So just a review, okay? So models okay, and standards, so those are the two of the six elements uh, architectural elements and at this point uh, you have to realize that it's all about everything you need and nothing you don't so there's no excess there's nothing super superfluous in architecture and if you recall these four key phrases or keywords why what how with what this would refer to the four views of our architecture so now we go with models so what is a solution architecture model? Well, simply put, it is a representation of the essential properties of some aspect or some aspects of a system. So it's meant to be some sort of a symbol, or in this case, a representation of what? Of certain properties of a system, okay? Or certain attributes, okay? And it has to be collective, right? It cannot just be like, uh, this is just one representation and another representation, another representation, and you don't put them together. That, that, that doesn't work. That's not a model. Okay, Your model would also show the interplay with all of these representations. Okay. So a model consists of a set of elements and the relationships between them and key properties. Okay, It promotes understanding by making the important things of use. Okay. So sometimes people might complain that the model, why, why, why do you have to do the model? Uh, isn't it obvious? Well, sometimes we require something that's visual so that the understanding is better, so that the understanding is richer. And who knows, there might be things that you thought was like that. You thought it was X, Y, Z. On the other hand, the moment that you start seeing the model, you realize, oh, it's not X, Y, Z, but A, B, C. Just, just to uh, highlight an example. And then uh, uh, a model facilitates reasoning about the system. So it helps augment the analysis of what the system will be. Now, what does the model represent? If we mention it's a representation, and what does it represent? Well, models are an essential aid for handling complexity and for leading to common understanding of the great variety of aspects of information systems. Okay. So models, well, number one, it's supposed to help handle complexity. And the reason why there's complexity is, number one, there could be a sheer high number of elements. So there are a lot of things at play. And number two, from these high number of elements, the relationships among them 
might also be uh, voluminous. Okay? And for you to keep track of all these behaviors, all these interactions, okay, uh, it's quite difficult if you don't have something that's at least visual or something that tries to explain everything in one perspective. Okay? Now, the bullet points listed here are examples of of models, okay, and they obviously represent certain things. Now, how are models used? So, there are many, many ways of how, how they're used. Well, they can be used to help in communicating with customers, users, or builders. So, you have like some sort of a common uh, talking point. At least both of you, you and maybe the customer, or the user, or the builder, you have something to talk about, okay? You, you know that you're looking at the same thing. And then there's no sense of ambigu ambiguity, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about the same thing. You're both looking at the same thing, okay? Uh, models are used also, okay? The maintenance of system integrity through coordination of designs and activities. So at least when you have a model, you have a, a, a good reference. Things can be fixed. Uh, there's no confusion. Uh, as to what the system will look like. So if you have a model, then everybody knows that you're talking of one and same reality. It's not my interpretation versus your interpretation. If you have a model, it's clear that this model is the correct representation of the system, not my perspective or not the other person's perspective. Okay, Models uh, help, okay? in design by providing templates and organizing and recording decisions, okay? It can also help explore and manipulate solution parameters and characteristics. So the nice thing about models is that if you're going to change one parameter, ideally the model will show how everything else will be impacted. So you can see the cause and effect that's going to happen in the model. Okay? And if you have a model, then it's clearer which ones would be impacted, which ones won't be impacted, okay? Which ones may be impacted, but not that much, okay? Uh, models are used uh, for guiding and recording aggregation and decomposition of systems functions, components, and objects, okay? So again, the, the perspective of reference. Okay, models can also be used to predict performance uh, or forecasting in some cases. Now, if you have models, now you know that if I put in the current figures right now, and if the model will tell me, ideally, it will also tell you cause and effect. Okay, then you know what's going to happen if you have these parameters there. Okay, so predicting performance, that's another way of using it. Uh, identifying critical system elements. So you, you look at the interactions in the system, you already find out that, okay, this particular component or element is critical because if I remove this, then my system breaks down. Or if I remove this, this element instead, okay, there might be a little bit of a slowdown, but the system or the model, the system rather, as depicted by the model will, will, will recover. Okay. And models provide acceptance criteria for certification of use. So you have the model and you have the system to be built. If the system that was built does not match the model, then you as the user or the decision maker can say no. I won't approve of that system, redo it. Or if it really matches with what the model uh, has been saying uh, it, it, would, it should do or it would do, then okay, uh, you as the user, decision maker, you can say, okay, approved. We will use it. Now, with our framework, the architecture framework, okay, so models apply in each of the four views. Okay, so why, what, how, with what. Now, models show the essential elements for the purpose of understanding, planning, or prediction. Okay? It does not require or depend on the use of formal modeling techniques. Creativity is encouraged. So, models, there are many models. And the thing there is that you are not constrained to use a particular model. Okay? You have the option to use a model that has been used in the past, that's one, or you can come up with your own. So you're not obligated to have something that's formal, that's based on literature, or based on some of the textbooks that you have. 
uh, on, on one hand, it would be an advantage if you are able to do some formal modeling because you can already make use of an existing vocabulary that is expected from that formal modeling technique. But in terms of the obligation to use it, uh, it it's not there. I mean, you have a choice. And if you decide to use it, good. If you decide not to use it, also good, as long as you have an adequate model that will really represent the system that you are trying to, to, to create or trying to do. So what are the common types of models? So in this particular uh, presentation, you have 10. Um, some of them are pretty straightforward, so I'll, I'll breeze through them very quickly. So a cycle model shows a cyclical process and the characterization of a cycle model is under repetition. There could be evolution, self-reinforcement, or self-correction. A seed model is a generator or trans transformer structure that shows a situation where a core component produces or collects and contains an array of results. So, so it's something that radiates outwards. Uh, typically, this would be for situations wherein you have one cause but having multiple effects. Your web model okay, shows a network of nodes or endpoints and connectors. Uh, so you can see the connections, you know, the, the segments between nodes. Flow model, this is used by process and flow analysis. So there is really a starting point and an end point, and then it cascades downwards. Okay. And the purpose here is you'd like to be able to trace the course of information or trace the course of goods, of services, or communications. Okay. So if there's like a cascading behavior, the flow model is typically a good model to use. A layer cake model, um, in a layer cake model, it's nothing, it's nothing super different from a layer model. Like you have one layer on top of the other. Uh, the layer cake model uh, presupposes that layers can be skipped. So it did not be a strict layered model wherein I have level one, level two, level three, level four going upwards. Okay. For me to go to level four, I have to go through level three first and, or, or level two first. In a cake model, it's possible that you can have some levels uh, that do not require the previous levels or all of them. So you can skip them. Okay. Bullseye model, this is useful for depicting systems that are rigorously structured in layers. So, so this is the, the layer, the, the true strict layered model, if you think about it, right? And we see the bullseye model typically for security related models. Okay? Wave model can help integrate identical or analogous processes that occur in multiple versions. So wave model, so you can think of this as parallel models that are the same, but the scope would be different, right? So, so you have like a wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, but in each wave, they actually impact different locations or different scopes, okay? but they're all, let's say, in one wave, wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four. A ring model shows some sort of a chaining of events, people, devices, or network addresses. These are non-directional, so they can go both ways. And they're non-hierarchical because they're pretty much in a ring, okay? There's no uh, indication which one is superior over the other, okay? You just know that they're connected to, to one another and they're, they're connected to everybody else through that ring. So your ring model can even be viewed as a very specific instance of a web model, right? So if you think about the web model, the ring model is, is a very, very specific example of a web model. Cell model is used to show categorization and compartmentalization. So you know, categories, okay, or groupings. So a cell model might be apt in, the, in those situations. A tree model, okay. Uh, here it's used to show systems with characteristics such as complex branching, diversification, and the implementation of distribution alternatives. Tree models are also used if you want to show hierarchy. So, so that's something that uh, a tree model would, would, would be useful for. So now we'll go through examples of models. 
So these are the typical models for the business view. Now notice that the models here are models that you've encountered, let's say, in some of your management courses, right? So some of you might be familiar with the product life cycle stages. Okay, that's a good model. Or if you're familiar with Michael Porter's five forces, okay, that's also another model. And the models that are listed here, these are not exhaustive. Okay, there are other models that are not listed here, but properly models for the business view. An example would be the strategy diamond. Okay, so some of you may not have heard of it, but it's it's a it's a legitimate model. Okay, it's I, I forget the 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 name of the proponent right now, but uh, it's somebody from Stanford University who proposed the strategic diamond model, or Another model for the business view would be known as the STARS model, S-T-A-R-S. This refers to transitions in, in businesses. This was developed by Michael Watkins, who's, who's been an expert on transitions and changes. So that's also a legitimate model, but it's not listed here. So the whole idea there is that there are so many models for the business view. Uh, just keep in mind that the business view aims to answer the question, why? Okay, so why? And normally these models are supposed to aid in that, in answering that question. So what are some examples? So here, now this is an example of what? It's a combination of a ring model, okay, and maybe a seed model. Or you can probably look at this as a web model even, right? And, and if you've noticed, the ring is unidirectional, so it just flows in one direction. It's still a ring model, no problem. Or you can even look at it as a cycle. So it's actually a cycle model as well. You can look at it that way. Or in this case, this model, what do you think this looks like? Okay. Does this look like... Uh, uh, a ring model? Does this look like a layered or model? Uh, does this look like so? So at the very least, it looks like a web model, right? Uh, shows shows a lot of things. The nodes interconnecting with one another. Uh, not really cycle because it doesn't really go back. But it could be a flow. It's a flow model, even. Or in this case, so what what type of model is this? Okay, you have layers, but the layers don't really seem to have any hierarchy. Okay, uh, you can view this also as a flow model. This one is a tree towards the, the right, bottom right, so that could be a tree model. So you've noticed that when you use a model, it need not be just only one. Based on the list of models that you have, uh, it could be a combination of those. Provided the intention of the model is to what? Is to represent the properties or attributes of the system. So what about the functional view? What are the typical models? Now, if you recall the answer, uh, sorry, the question regarding functional view, it's supposed to answer the question, uh, what? Okay, so normally functions in an organization, so policies, a functional model, like if it's an accounting model, is it a, is it a sales model? Is it a distribution model? Okay. Is it a logistics model? So these are typical models in the functional view. Okay. What would be examples? So here we have a data warehousing infrastructure model. Okay. You can see a tree model here. Okay. A little bit of the, yeah, mostly tree. It's mostly tree. Here in this case is a flow model. See the flows for the supply chain. This one is a layered model. Layered and flow. Well, not really flow because there's really no connection from one to the other. It's more of a layered layered model. Now, this one is a bullseye model. You see it here. Okay, and, and now you see everything else, your bullseye. This one, okay, uh, this, this, this probably tells you some layers, maybe some flow or some, 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 some web-based models, or it could even be tree. I mean, it uh, depends on how you try to represent the, this particular model in front of you. Now, what about the typical models for the technical view? Again, technical view answers the question, how? 
So how? Your, your model should be able to help answer the question how. So examples would be your information life cycle, okay, layered products, or your system overview. So in this case, this is uh, another flow model that we see, but you can probably see some, some layer models here. Okay. Well, this one's another layered model, okay, with a little bit of flow uh, around it. Okay. So this is another example of a tree model, perhaps, with a little bit of a layered so the security firewall. Okay, again, another tree or layered model. Okay. It's a technical model. Okay. And typical models for the implement view. Okay, so your administration model, your RI model, org chart, that's an implementation view. Uh, your planning model, your implement model. Remember that for the implementation view, the question that you'd like to answer is with what? So you want to be specific with how you implement things, right? So the organization, the people involved, uh, uh, product implement, okay, so implementation, implementation view, prod, uh, planning. So it does answer the question with what? Okay. ROI model, the the with what question is answered, let's say, through through capital. So it answers that question. So it would be example. So here, this is a model of uh, your, your ROI, so to speak, right? So if you have implementation time in the x-axis and your implementation cost in the y-axis, then you can see the trajectory or the trend of your costs. So it's a model. And you can see... Okay, uh, elements along the way, okay, at which point along the curve do you notice, okay, or, okay, or if there's some movements, okay, or at what stage it's supposed to be. Okay, an org chart. So an org chart is, a, is an implement model. It can be the org chart of a company or it can be an org chart of the, of the team. Okay, uh, it, uh, the org chart is supposed to represent the the assignments of people working in that particular scope for your solution. Now, some final thoughts about models, okay? So, architectural models are a powerful way to illustrate principles in each view. And typically, you work with models and standards uh, when you have principles already in mind. So, if you think that, okay, I will use social media to, to to gather my marketing, for example. Then, you know, okay, from social media marketing, then you can have possible models. You can probably have a layered model, maybe, or some sort of a, a web model. You can do that. For it, but but the, the point there is that when you try to identify the model to be used, it has to be consistent with what the principles say. Okay. Now, architectural models are a good method to help you develop the principles, okay? And, you know, models are very helpful with a technical audience. Okay? It helps them keep focused. And the models will tell you whether it is complete, okay? Everything you need and nothing you don't. Okay? You don't put something in a model that you know is not needed. So if you know that's not needed, why put it in the model? For what purpose, right? It's not answering a problem. So don't put it there. You put it out. Okay. If you see a useful model, if you think that this model seems to be useful, ask the customer, what are the principles behind this picture? Okay. And they should be able to tell you why that model is illustrated that way. Okay, it's, It need not be uh, a very sophisticated answer. In fact, it's good if it's if it's not a sophisticated answer. It means that the customer understands the principles behind the models. Okay? Otherwise, if if it were very complicated and you have a model that's also complicated, uh, the stakeholder may not be able to understand why that is so. 
Okay? So it's important that your models have to be simple as well. Okay? Uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay? So this is a very good saying. What's the point here? Remember that models are just representations. They're not your end-all and be-all. Okay? And sometimes, perhaps along your study, in the program, you will realize that, okay, you've been, you've been exposed to developing models, making sure that they really fit well, that they follow certain rules, right? Um, especially for formal modeling. But at the end of the day, uh, models are just representations. They're not your solution, okay? Uh, and because they are a representation of something, especially if you're trying to estimate the, the picture of reality, well, models will never be 100% exact. Okay, so in, in, that, in that sense, this, this guy is saying, well, all models are wrong. Okay, they'll never be 100% correct. But some of them will be useful. Useful for what? Well, we've already mentioned some examples on how models are used. Okay, could be used for prediction, could be used for validation, could be used for better understanding. But models in themselves, okay, it's it's never the case where in models are 100% accurate. There will always be some deviations in certain things. And the reason why there are deviations in certain things is because maybe we don't have complete information or because the situation has changed. Therefore, the parameters have also changed. And if that happens, well, automatically your model is no longer accurate. It's no longer reflective of the of, of true reality. So, so it's it's by definition wrong. So, and this is like a, a word of warning for people not to be too attached to models, especially if models are used for prediction. So, you use a model to forecast something. Maybe you are lucky in doing some of them, but for others that may not be the case. So here are some books uh, you can read, uh, uh, useful paper. Now we go to the last topic on standards. So this would be our last architectural element that we'll talk about. And what is a standard? Well, a standard is a well-defined convention or measure with which a system must comply. Okay, It is an implementation decision of a principle. Okay, So... When you recall your attributes of, of a principle, right? So you have your rational, you have your implications, your obstacles, and your action. A standard has to exist in the action, okay? So if the action does not foresee the use of a standard, then you cannot put that as the standard for your, for your you, okay? And what are standards? Well, a set of characteristics, conditions, constraints, measures, disciplines, and processes. It's used for constraining or for evaluating the development, implementation, and management of a product or system. Uh, it can be separately captured, but it can also be included in implications or as metrics. Okay. So not only will you find it under action, you should be able to find uh, some lead material of the standard in your implications. Okay. Now, in our framework, the term standards include metrics, measures, business rules, and so on. So why are they necessary? Well, they make the architecture real and relevant. They also define the operational conditions in terms of people, in terms of process, or in terms of IT. And they are required for a detailed design and build of a solution, especially if the standards exist, then for a particular problem, then it should be used. It should be considered. Now, standards can change and often do. Okay, And sometimes standards change more frequently than principles and models. For example, you guys have been familiar with project management. So there is a standard as regards determining whether a person can be considered as a project management professional. Okay, so, but, but then the standards change over the years. So you have version 1, version 2, version 3, version 4, version 5, version 6, so on and so forth. And they change. Okay. 
So there are two kinds of standards. So you have your de jure standards. So these are written down and enforced by a governing body. De facto standards, these are accepted as the rule because of dominance by a particular entity or by widespread acceptance of a group. Okay. So de jure, okay, by law, de facto, by fact. Okay. Uh, the Euro standards uh, tend to be more prescriptive in the sense that if you know that it's imposed by law, more often than not, you have to follow them. Okay. The fact of standards, on the other hand, is a little bit more lenient. You don't really have to, 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 to follow what is common out there. It's possible that it's it has become de facto standard by convention. Okay. For example, in recent months, we've seen that a de facto standard for for communication, okay, for for your uh, video conferencing would be Zoom. But nobody's telling us to use Zoom. So it's not a de jure standard, it's a de facto standard. Now, uh, driving standards within an engagement, okay, most commonly standards appear within implications. Okay, so there could be specific standards or there is an agreed need for standards and criteria. So when, especially if you're talking with stakeholders, it's possible that you've mentioned that, okay, we have to follow certain standards, okay. And, or it can be an agreed need for a process to define or maintain standards. So maybe, it's neither a de jure nor de facto standard. Maybe there hasn't been something that exists in order for you to solve your problem. So it's possible that there will be an agreement that you create your own standard. Okay. So the examples of standards are, are written here. So here are some, some, some standards here. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I'll leave this exercise uh, to you to do on your own. So there are many standards here. So there are technical standards. There could be also uh, work standards. Remember, uh, there are two types of standards, the URE and the facto. You can see a lot of the URE standards here, especially with the protocols, right? Uh, but there could be de facto standards okay, that we may not be aware of, okay? So just to wrap the, the, the last three architectural elements together, principles, models, and standards, how do they fit together? Well, principles are related to and aligned with business drivers, business goals, and metrics. So the first three. Models are informed by and reflect the principles and standards. Standards are constraints or rules. So you can see the interaction of these three. Okay. Uh, in there, and you can see that okay, standards can change. Okay, models can also change. So here are some examples. Okay, some some key indicators if you're looking at certain sub views of a business view. So we said earlier. I mean, from from a previous session, we know that a view can have some sub views. So normally, these are your topic areas. So we've talked about topic areas. So let's say in the case of a business view, your topic area can be a business overview, the marketplace, your stakeholders, the value chain. Okay, so here are some principles, stand, models, and standards. Here, so I'm going to breeze through them quickly. And that is pretty much the end of our lecture and presentation on models and standards. Uh, are there any questions on the topic itself? Wala naman po, sir. Okay. None, sir. Okay, so I will stop recording. <laughs>